Member, as time has expired. I call uh, Paul Foster Bell. Uh, e te mana whakawa tuarua tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa e ngā mema o te whariparamata o Aotearoa. Uh, Mr Speaker, in taking a call on this private international law choice of law and tort bill in this uh, debate, um, I have great pleasure rising to support uh, the bill that was put forward by my respected colleague, uh, Sarah Dowie, the member for Invercargill. Uh, sir, I'm not a legal expert um, or even a lawyer, um, but luckily we have uh, talent in this House in that area, and I would obviously acknowledge that of the member who just resumed his seat. Um, but I, I did want to um, just comment on one um, statement that the Honourable David Parker made in his speech around parties which may choose to contract, particularly in international business dealings, uh, on which jurisdiction and which law would apply um, in their business dealings. Um, as I say, I'm not a lawyer, sir, but my understanding of what a tort is is that it's a wrongful act other than a breach of contract. So I do wonder, as, this, uh, as we go through the process and as we um, discuss it in the committee stage, if, if uh, the member may be able to, perhaps if I'm wrong, correct my misunderstanding of what we're dealing with here. Um, and I am genuinely interested in this point, Mr Speaker, because uh, obviously I've had my arbitration um, bill uh, drawn, which I think has some... Um, relation to this uh, piece of legislation. Uh, actually, I also have to say that this bill, the Private International Law Choice of Law and Tort Bill, was briefly in the ballot under my name. I think it, is, um, it has been uh, in the process for some time. Uh, it was originally introduced, I think, under our friend and former colleague Chris Ockenvold's name. Um, and then, obviously, uh, with uh, the Honourable David Bennett before he uh, joined the executive, um, but Sarah has done uh, incredibly good work, both as chair, Sarah Dowie has done good work, both as chair of the select committee and sponsor of the bill in ensuring that um, the different views are heard on it and that uh, members do gain a greater understanding of what is a somewhat technical area of the law. Uh, and I certainly bow down to the, the legal brilliance of colleagues such as the Honourable Judith Collins, who was a uh, noted I think, member of the legal profession and I believe president of the Auckland District Law Society um, for a term. Um, but sir, with my rudimentary knowledge of the law, uh, I was uh, very interested to observe uh, as we went through the hearings process that uh, what we were considering here in codifying in statute a significant change in how private international law uh, jurisdictional issues would be addressed. Uh, represented a departure from something like 800 years of development of the common law. Uh, and being a traditionalist, sir, I'm very hesitant to see any departure from uh, something that's uh, so carefully and, and in such a considered way developed over 800 years. Um, uh, but uh, the concept that we are moving to from double actionability, uh, which is the ancient concept, uh, to this bill which provides for lex loci delicti commissi, that is, the law of the place in which the harm or wrong was committed um, should apply, uh, is itself not a new concept. I believe, sir, that lex loci delicti um, was, uh, came about in the United Kingdom as a, a legal concept in the 19th century. And as has been discussed uh, by other members so far in this debate, um, jurisdictions such as the United Kingdom and Australia already uh, apply the principle of lex loci delicti instead of the previous um, double actionability uh, in order to provide greater clarity uh, to, pe to particularly those operating in the international business sphere, although not uh, restricted solely to that. And I believe my colleague uh, John O'Naylor, the List uh, Member of Parliament from Palmerston North, had a very um, interesting case that wasn't strictly uh, a, commercial, a modern commercial dispute. But actually, um, the abolition of the rule of uh, double actionability and establishment of a general rule that the applicable law is the law of the country where the events constituting the tort occurred is, in my view, a, uh, a useful development. Although, as has been uh, mentioned, there are, there are areas where um, we do need to explore the detail to ensure that we as a House are doing the right thing in effectively rewriting uh, 800 years of common law development. 
So it is more uh, obvious in a case of uh, property issues, for instance. If your property is damaged, uh, that is uh, pretty straightforward to understand what the property is, what the damage was that occurred, and where it occurred, and then apply the relevant local rules and legislation to that case. But has be, as has been um, canvassed in, in the debate, uh, areas such as personal injury are somewhat more uh, difficult to uh, understand and um, to provide, I think, comprehensive uh, legal provisions for that will um, provide great certainty in all uh, such cases of personal injury. So if we look at the Accident Compensation Act uh, 2001, uh, it, there are a couple of components to what might constitute an accident. And it was very interesting that the Honourable David Parker referred to certain forms of infection as constituting an accident or a, an accidental injury. Um, because, of course, most uh, diseases, most medical conditions that aren't the result of the application of external force causing harm or injury, um, such as a broken leg or, or even actually a millipede bite, believe it or not, is, uh, constitutes an accident in uh, terms of the Accident Compensation Act 2001. Um, but uh, where someone may have, for instance, been infected due to medical malpractice, due to unclean... Ah, oh, yes, Donoghue and Stevenson. Uh, of course, being a, um experienced lawyer, the Honourable David Parker, would know that case. I, I think I studied that in first-year law uh, at Otago University with Professor Mark Hennigan, I think, in the introduction. Yes, the snail and the ginger beer. So pers personal injury um, can be caused by other than um, merely a physical accident, but, uh, for instance, some negligence on the part of a tour company that may lead to a severe sunburn and then a skin infection. Um, that could result from that severe sunburn. Uh, it could, of course, be something far more sinister, such as someone knowing that they have a, uh, a contagious and serious disease and not taking proper precautions, prophylactic precautions, to prevent that being uh, passed on to another person. And in some jurisdictions, that would... That would prophylactic measures, uh, Mr Bishop. Um, so, the protections, um, being safe. Uh, so uh, in some jurisdictions that would constitute more than just an accident resulting in injury but an actual assault on another person. Um, so I think actually it is right and proper that, um, that the remedies that would be available to the person if they didn't take the proper, if the, the person who um, committed the tort against them didn't take the pro proper prophylactic protections, um, the remedies that are available in that jurisdiction uh, should be available to the person who has suffered uh, the tortuous damage. Um, and as the member uh, across the uh, aisle has commented, uh, mental injury does need to be considered. So I think it is uh, absolutely appropriate that when we consider this bill, uh, we have made a rec recommendation of amending um, the current statutory bar on personal injury claims in section 317 of the Accident Compensation Act 2001. We think it is desirable to amend clause 7 uh, to state specifically how the bill would treat personal injury, and our proposed insertion of clause 72AA would make it clear that the applicable law in these cases would be the law of the country uh, where the individual was when they were injured. We also make a, a couple of consequential uh, uh, suggestions of amendments uh, to uh, clause 73, which provides a definition of personal injury and expands that uh, to include uh, the mental injuries uh, of the sorts that have been discussed, uh, diseases and infections. Uh, so, uh, sir, there is a, another interesting question which uh, we did discuss in the select committee and uh, it was actually quite an electrifying discussion, I have to say. Um, some people might find this a rather dry area of the law. Uh, but the distinction between substance and procedure was, uh, was raised. So clause 11 to B, uh, which specified the questions of procedure are to be determined according to New Zealand law, um, we uh, thought it was desirable that uh, in these cases um, the distinction between substance and procedure should be allowed to evolve over time. Um, we live in an electronic age uh, where... 
uh, one may be able to, in due course, con conduct one's, uh, one's uh, litigation electronically, for instance. And so we recommended inserting clause 11.3 to clarify that the courts will be able to further develop the distinction between substance and procedure um, through case law over time. This is a very good bill, Mr Speaker, and I commend it to the House. I call David Clendon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um